today. Despite the way the audience looks, we did not make this a woman on the <laughs> Men don't eat sugar. <laughs> oh my God. It's always that. So today we are welcoming Dr. Nicole Fenske and she's a certified functional medicine practitioner, which she'll be talking about a little bit. She's a chiropractor. She's a board certified nutritionist. And she's amazing. Um, I invited her with mixed feelings because I've had a lifelong love affair with sugar. And I said to her one time, Nicole, I need to start a 12-step support group to get off sugar. And she said, Susan, that would be a great idea. So today we're going to talk about, and, and I specifically scheduled it the day after Valentine's Day. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so at times if you have a question and you entertain it, you, could you repeat the question just yeah. so that we can catch it? Because we are live streaming, so let me know if this side's the better side or... Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Turn you're welcome. Me. So um, we'll make this informal. If you have questions, let me know. But I do realize that you're, we're live streaming and maybe taping it for people to see later, so I don't want to get too off track. I'll stay afterwards for a few minutes if people have other questions. Um, I practice in Middleton, Spensky Holistic Healthcare Center is my practice. Um, let's see, functional medicine is a whole talk in and of itself, um, but it's getting to the root cause of people's health problems. Uh, there's three certified functional medicine doctors in the state of Wisconsin, uh, me and then a medical doctor in Viroqua and a medical doctor in Wauwatosa. There are other people that practice functional medicine um, and this paradigm of healthcare of asking why someone has a certain condition and working with lifestyle and um, nutrition and supplements to um, correct the problem. So there's a lot, there are practitioners that do it, there's just three of us that have gone kind of all that way to become certified. So let me know if you have any questions about that later. But because we have a lot to talk about just about sugar. Um, so sugar is making us sick. And I'm guessing if you guys are here that you're not like, I don't ever eat sugar. You know, so I mean if you're here, it's because you, you need some information. And uh, truth, truth of the matter is most of us eat sugar a lot. Um, it's in 80% of the added, uh, of, the, of the food, of the processed foods. So it's almost hard to avoid. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to 100% avoid added sugar. And I'm not talking about a piece of fruit or um, um, some dried fruit. I'm talking about added sugar. It's very hard because it's in your breakfast cereal, it's in your bread, it's in your condiments, it's in your sauces, um, it's at the um, staff meeting, it's at the soccer game, it's at church. <laughs> you know, it used to be that, um, you know, Ma Ingalls and Mary and Laura, you know, maybe they had a pie once a week or something if they happen to have the stuff to make it, but it wasn't all day long in every meal and um, 
uh, in everything, in, in every situation that they came across. So I think it's a very modern problem. It's challenging. Um, and sugar is one of the worst things for us. And I'm not saying we need to 100% avoid it unless someone truly has an addiction, then that's different. Um, but we need to significantly reduce it and get back to how our ancestors were eating it or how the Ingalls were eating it on the prairie, you know, just in moderation, um, not uh, every day and every meal. So um, sugar is making us sick. So there are lots of cultural challenges um, to avoiding sugar, and I've already named a lot of them. It's everywhere. Um, uh, fast food is common. Uh, we're not rested, and so we crave sugar to um, buck us up and get us through the next few hours. Um, there are lots of kind of Western cultural problems that are affecting our health, that are um, affecting our diet, that are affecting our choices. Um, like I said, this is not the easiest place in the world to be healthy, and so that's why we're here, right? We actually have to have a class to talk about how not to eat sugar. You know, a few hundred years ago, we would have never had this class. And there's certain cultures where they wouldn't be having this class, but the fact that we're even here today says our culture has a problem with some things, and we're trying to be aware and mindful and, and change that. Um, yeah, no, that's fine. So this is just... Every time you turn on the TV or turn around, there's um, there's these kinds of ads, too. That's actually my TV from when I first got married. It was a big box. My husband made that slide like 15 years ago. So I um, just wanted to point out the TV. <laughs> okay, so I do realize that this World Health Organization... So let's look at how we're doing in the United States with our diet and with our health. We spend more per person on health than any other country yet in country. We are not doing great. Um, how poorly the United States is doing. Okay. Um, so you are we eat eight of the top ten causes of death are directly related to poor nutrition. Um, so pretty much everything but accidents uh, and suicide. All of those other things have a nutritional component to them. So when you start making different choices and start eating better, um, that's what I love about natural health care and functional medicine is that when you start caring for your body, you're not just pre preventing the one disease you don't want to get, you're preventing everything. You're elevating your overall level of wellness. Um, but whether it's heart disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, um, immune system challenges, diabetes, um, changing your diet, um, eating a more whole foods-based diet, decreasing your sugar consumption, it helps to prevent all of those things. You get so much bang for your buck when you start to be more mindful of your diet. Okay. So 70, I said this before, 75% uh, of an individual's health after age 40 is dependent upon what the person has done to his or her genes, not to the genes themselves. So for better or for worse, our genetics are only part of it, and our choices are an even bigger part of it the older we get. So the older we get, um, the more our health is really dependent upon the things we have control over, what we choose to eat um, or not eat, if we choose to exercise or not, stress, our relationships, how much sleep we get. Um, so if we bathe our genes in good stuff, they might not be triggered and we might not get those diseases or maybe the expression of that gene won't happen until we're a lot older. I'm certain that I have a diabetes gene. All, all four of my grandparents had diabetes. My mom would have diabetes, she's 80, but she doesn't, um, if she didn't exercise so much and eat so well. Both of her brothers have diabetes, so my uncles that are in their 80s. I'm certain I have that gene. If I eat well and I exercise, maybe I won't get diabetes until I'm 90, or maybe I'll never get it. So you can put off the expression of genes, or maybe they'll, they'll never be triggered um, if you have a healthy lifestyle. So a calorie is not a calorie. Some calories cause disease more than others. Different calories are metabolized differently. I've had so many experiences where I see people checking the calories in things and not looking at the quality of the food, right? So I could eat 2,000 calories a day of broccoli and not gain weight. But I, if I eat 2,000 calories a day of, of um, donuts, so sugar and, and, and white flour, I would gain weight. So we can't just look at calories. We really, it's more important we have to look at the quality of our food and how it's metabolized and how it fuels us. Um, so. Um, we need to let go of that idea of looking so much at calories and looking at the quality of our food, okay? So we're an overfed 
an undernourished culture. I mean, most of us, certainly everybody in this room has enough to eat. Um, you know, we can't say that in every part of the United States. We can't say that in every part of the world. But at least the people that are here today, we all just go to the grocery store and basically buy what we want. But therein, in part, lies the problem. <laughs> we buy what we want. Um, and so um, we don't have a problem um, with, uh, you know, um, um, lack of food. But we're overfed and undernourished because we're not getting quality food, a lot of us. So if I had a magic wand, you know, a lot of my patients say to me, so should I cut out, like, what, trans fats, or is it GMOs, or is it, uh, what about um, too much alcohol, or, well, certainly that is a problem, uh, sugar, there's a lemonade. And, if, and so I would say, if I had a magic wand and I could just change one thing for the greatest good, it would be taking, just taking sugar out of the equation, taking sugar out of people's diets. I'm not saying GMOs aren't, aren't good, aren't, aren't inflammatory. Um, they are, and they're not good. I'm not saying trans fats aren't inflammatory and cause heart disease, etc. I'm just saying, if I could just change one thing and focus on one thing, take sugar out, and the diet is significantly elevated all of a sudden. Of course, when you take out sugar, you're also taking out a lot of those other things. But sugar is the thing that is ubiquitous, that's not just causing diabetes, it's causing heart disease, it um, creates inflammation which can lead to cancer, it causes joint pain, it causes cognitive problems. Um, we know that some people are in the, in the medical world are sort of half-jokingly calling Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes because of the sugar component to um, dementia. So sugar is one of those things that if we could just change that one thing, there are so many diseases that would be reduced or eliminated. So what is sugar? You know, what, what are we talking about? It comes from beet, cane, or corn. So when you buy refined sugar, it's coming from one of those plants. So sugar by another name, if you start to read labels, you'll see that it's just really confusing because it doesn't just say sugar. It says barley malt, beet sugar, brown sugar, butter sugar, uh, cane sugar, caramel, etc. You know, anything with syrup. So um, it has more nutritional value than, um, let's say, just genetically modified non-organic cane sugar that you, you know, just the regular sugar that one might get. But it's still affecting your blood sugar, so it still has to be um, ingested in moderation. And I get that question all the time. What about honey? What about maple syrup? Yes, these things are in their natural form, so they have more nutritional value. But when they're eaten all the time, and none of them were ever meant to be eaten all the time, they still raise your blood sugar, they still cause inflammation and disease. So we can't just say, oh, because it's natural, it's good. Um, if you go back a thousand years, we were hunters and gatherers and farmers, we weren't eating sugar at every meal. So even if it's natural sugar and has more nutritional value, it still affects blood sugar in the same way and needs to be eaten in moderation. But it's certainly a better choice than white refined sugar. So like I, I'll, I consume honey, I love honey, um, maple syrup, but none of it every day and none of it in large amounts. Um, so, um, so there's kind of page after page here, you can keep going, Susan, of other of, um, malt syrup, malt reductors, malt. So just page after page, of, this is, these are all the different names for sugar. So anything with sugar, syrup, or oats in the ending, if you look at that last bullet point. Um, so you know anything that tastes sweet, don't be fooled. People are like, oh, this is sugar-free. Well, first of all, it probably has aspartame in it, if it's sugar-free and sweet. If something's sweet, it's sweet for a reason. It either has a chemical in it, like aspartame, which is a, neuro, a known neurotoxin, um, or it has some kind of sugar in it. So, you know, we want to have our cake and eat it too, right? We want to just eat something that's sweet and rich and not have it have one of those things in it, and it does. So we have to change our taste buds a little bit and just get used to things that are not as sweet and just decrease the portions of those things. So stevia is not a carbohydrate, and so it does, that is the one exception, it does not affect blood sugar. So in my household, we have a little bit of honey in moderation, usually local and raw, um, like from the farmer's market. Um, and we do have, all, so I have a 14-year-old son. 
and you know he doesn't drink soda, he doesn't drink juices, um, but he likes a sweet drink every once in a while. So I have organic, you know, lemon juice that I just buy already squeezed and throw that and ten drops of stevia into a glass, and there's his lemonade. And stevia, especially the decent stuff that you get, not not um, I don't want to use any brands, but there's. Um, you know, there's certain brands that are not very good, but if you go to a natural um, health food store and buy a very pure stevia, as far as we know, there's no ill effects. It's not a carbohydrate. It doesn't raise your blood sugar. And used in moderation, it could be absolutely fine. It's just very bitter if you try and bake with it, so it's hard for it to be a replacement for all kinds of sugar. Okay. So it's important to realize that when we talk about sugar, all sugars are included, and I guess this is uh, what we were just talking about. So when you're eval evaluating your sugar consumption, you can't stop counting once you've accounted for the number of spoons of table sugar you've added to foods and beverages. You must also include all other types of sweeteners, such as corn-based sweeteners, like high fructose corn syrup, honey, maple syrup, agave. So that's really what we were saying before, is, um, and what Michael Pollan says in his, um, the journalist that writes a lot about nutrition and does a lot of research on it, he pretty much says, Sugar is sugar is sugar. I mean, it's, it's, whether it's natural or not, it ultimately affects your body in the same way. Um, okay. Sweets were meant to be eaten seasonally and in moderation. You know, so again, go back a few thousand years ago. These blueberries are in season, let's eat them. These raspberries are in season, let's eat them. Um, we didn't have a way of um, having sweeteners all year round at every meal. So. Our bodies simply have not evolved to handle that much sugar. Um, it's just way too much for our constitutions and it's so inflammatory and creates that milieu in our body that leads to so many diseases. Is sugar addictive? I mean, ask this guy. <laughs> Clearly it is. And I think we've all felt like him before. Um, okay. So, cookies. Um, so, is it... Is sugar addicting? I don't want to throw around that word lightly, right? Because that's a really serious word to use. But let's look at the characteristics of what makes something addictive. Um, you crave it, you have increased intake, you have withdrawal symptoms. So if you eat a fair amount of sugar and you stop, and if anyone in the room has ever done this, you will know that you have withdrawal symptoms when you stop eating sugar. People relapse, you know, they go back for it again. Um, they have cravings, there's an inability to stop. So is it addictive? Absolutely. It has every characteristic of an addictive drug or an addictive substance. Okay? So drugs, alcohol, and sugar all create dependencies in the brain for the substance because without them, and this is, it starts to affect our neurotransmitters, the level of serotonin, the, ner the neurotransmitter serotonin in the brain drops. Addictive substances typically raise serotonin levels for a short period of time, so you're like, huh, that feels good. I got a little more serotonin, I'm relieved. You know, that's how you feel after you eat sugar. It bumps you up for a while emotionally. But then that results in a good positive feeling, and then there's that crash that occurs later. And that crash is not just the serotonin and dopamine and other neurotransmitters uh, leaving your body. It's your, it's your blood sugar crashing, right? And then what do you need to keep going? Coffee and sugar. <laughs> so it's just, you know, uh, when you eat a lot of sugar, it's this kind of cycle throughout the day, um, and it's definitely addictive. So um, dopamine also plays a role in sugar addiction, not just serotonin. Due to the dopamine reward system, a person may not be hungry after a meal, but wants the reward of dessert. And that's the um, what dopamine is our reward um, neurotransmitters. So when they're trying to get people off of certain drugs or um, get them off of cigarettes, um, there are drugs that manipulate dopamine to help you with um, addiction. So if the person thinks about the dessert and doesn't get it, this can cause the person to feel depressed. To make it even worse, the more sugar you eat, the more blunted the reward center in the brain becomes, requiring even more sugar to make you feel good. Here's a study from Princeton. When given the choice, this is a, a rodent study, when given the choice between sugar and healthy food, the rats pushed the healthy food away because they wanted nothing but sugar. When the rats were given a choice between plain water and sugar water, they chose the sugar water. 
Taking the sugar water away caused the rats to experience withdrawal symptoms. Here's a study from University of Bordeaux in France. Even in cases, this is a, a co cocaine versus sugar, like the shui wa. Um, even in cases when the rat was addicted to cocaine first and then given the choice between cocaine and saccharin, it chose saccharin. The researchers concluded that the sweetness of sugar and its substitutes can surpass cocaine re rewards even in addicts. So here's the problem. Sugar is addictive and it's socially acceptable, right? It wouldn't or down a bunch of um, shots of vodka, you know, so that like that wouldn't be acceptable behavior. But if I were up here and we had like a big plate of donuts that we were all gonna eat afterwards, that's completely socially acceptable. And so um, the way I see it, that's a problem, you know, when, when we can just eat it and nobody's nobody's judging us, you know, about that. So in 1821, we consumed about 10 pounds of sugar per person, that's per year, and now we are consuming about 156 pounds, and about a third of that is from soft drinks. So just cutting out the liquid sugar would make a big difference. Fructose is the number one source of calories in the United States. So again, those liquid sugars, high fructose corn syrup, um, people are, they, they think they're doing better because, um, well, I don't drink soda. Yeah, but you're getting that chai latte that's just liquid sugar, you know. So um, all that liquid sugar, we're going to find out in a few slides, is even worse than solid sugar. So how much sugar is okay? The American Heart Association says that men should eat no more than 37.5 grams a day and women 25 grams. And I think on this handout that um, I included for you guys, I do believe I put on there... I split the difference between men and women, and I said tips for reducing sugar, eat 30 grams or fewer each day. So I did put that on there. But you can, uh, says. Um, the World Health Organization, so I looked at all the different, you know, organizations to see what people were saying about this. The World Health Organization says both men and women should eat 25 grams a day or fewer. So that's 6.25 teaspoons. It should be limited, limited to three to four teaspoons a day. So here's uh, an important conversion for you if you're going to start reading later. So it's in grams, right? They're not going to make this easy for you to figure out. You know, I wish that the U.S. government was making label reading really easy so we could all be healthier, but so um, to convert grams to teaspoons, when you look at a, at a label, it's going to be in grams. Bilibar, that's four teaspoons. Okay, if you're an elementary school kid, you're done for the day. Okay, so you'd be fat. You'd be surprised how quickly this adds up. America now consumes 22 to 28 teaspoons. Remember, I said about just corn syrup and table sugar. And that's a lot of empty calories that few of us can afford. A 12 ounce can of soda has 10. Okay, 10 teaspoons. Preschoolers consume 10 to 12 <coughs> teaspoons a day, and they're supposed to consume three to four. So is it just? Yeah. So <laughs> that's a whole other lecture. So um, mostly, so he, the, the, the labeling laws, they don't put added sugar on there, right. which is, they should, right? That's not okay. <laughs> that's not okay. But they don't do that. Mm -hmm. And again, the sugar industry has some good lobbyists. So on your label, and we're going to look at the label in a second, under carbs, it says, we were talking before about coconut sugar and stevia and maple syrup. We still want to limit our sugar. I don't want to form of honey or maple syrup, I still want to limit it because it still affects my blood sugar, it still causes inflammation, and leads to lots of diseases. Mm -hmm. So um, so they don't distinguish on labels, but we, we do want to limit our sugars, really even our natural sugars, to this amount. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy to do, yeah. but it's healthy. So um, Kellogg's Original All Brand, that sounds like a super healthy cereal to me, contains about one half teaspoons of sugar and just a half cup. So if you're a preschooler, you're halfway there for the day after breakfast. Um, honey Roasted um, Honey Bunches of Oats contains three and a half teaspoons of sugar and two thirds of a cup. And that's kind of a normal serving, two thirds of a cup. Kashi Go Lean Crunch contains 3.5 teaspoons in a cup. So 
I'm just trying to make the point that it adds up really fast and there's added sugar and all these things that sound really healthy. Like, this sounds like a healthy choice compared to Captain Crunch, or what does that still exist? But, you know, th this sounds like a healthy choice, right? So I'm going to buy this for my child instead of Captain Crunch. But the point is that it's still a lot of sugar, so we shouldn't fool ourselves. Um, most processed foods has added sugar in it because they want to sell their product, right? So if it tastes good and it's addictive, it's going to sell better. So they're not going to make sh cereal or uh, granola bars without sugar because they're trying to sell sell something. So. Here's a label. Okay, you, can, you can't read this, so you're just going to have to trust me. Um, this is a Cliff Bar. So I was just curious because, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it's a Cliff Bar. It's healthy. You can, like, buy them at REI and, you know, everybody's super fit there. Um, but... Um, <laughs> But if, if you look over here, it has 22 grams of sugar in it. So you're done. You're done for the day after your cliff bar. So, um, and I'm, I don't even remember what, you know, what kind of cliff bar this was. It was just something I grabbed off a shelf and took a picture of. I'm sure maybe some of them have less and some of them have more. But I'm just trying to make the point that these things that we think are healthy, like Kashi Goling Crunch or whatever or Cliff Bars, a lot of them have a lot of sugar in them, and so we just need to be aware and not fool ourselves. You know, you may as well have the Snickers bar. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, um, but my point is that if you're going to eat that much sugar, you know. Anyway. Okay, the FDA does not require manufacturers to distinguish between natural and added sugars on food labels, like you were saying, Nicole. Okay. The most common sugar added foods we consume are breads, ketchup, other condiments, so like mayonnaise, soups, salad, dressings, crackers, cereals, yogurt, sauces, instant oatmeal, desserts, juice drinks, and soda. I guess the reason I put this on here is because we're, a lot of us are sitting here thinking, I need to cut back on donuts and soda and cookies. And I'm like, well, but what about your all the condiments and the salad dressing? Like yogurt, things that sound healthy that have added sugar. Now there's ways around these things. I make my own salad dressing. It tastes really good. I put a couple drops of stevia in it because then my son eats the salad a little bit more readily. Um, I don't buy sweetened yogurt. It's plain. Um, I like it plain. My son and husband don't. A few drops of stevia fixes that. Um, I buy unsweetened ketchup. Um, I buy unsweetened mayonnaise. So all these little things, you start to realize that these things exist or you can make your own or you can buy unsweetened things and make them taste good with stevia. Um, so you make these little things, and then all of a sudden you're significantly reducing your daily consumption of sugar by educating yourself and doing these little things. Okay. So why do we care? Like, why, why are we even having this conversation? So, so big deal. We eat a lot of sugar, um, and it's addictive. But is it hurting us? So, you know, what's the big deal? Um, there's a lot of research that says it's a problem. Um, so here's just some of the many things that it can cause or is associated with. Um, immune system suppression. And there's actual data on when you eat X amount of grams of sugar for seven hours afterwards, your white blood cell production is suppressed. That, that, that's your army of immune cells, right? So we actually know when you eat sugar, your white blood cell production goes down for a certain amount of hours afterwards. But people are perpetually eating sugar. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you that people who have recurrent seasonal illness, and we all get sick every once in a while, but the people who are sick all the time in my practice are usually the ones that eat a lot of sugar. Not always. Some people seem to have immune systems of steel and can eat sugar and never get sick, but sugar is a big immune system suppressor. Um, juvenile delinquency, there's a fair amount of studies in England about that, that when you change a kid's diet, if they have a lot of behavioral problems, that, that can quiet down significantly. So when my son went to, kin went to kindergarten, and he's 14 now, but I could really control his diet until he went to school, and then I was shocked that at every birthday and every half birthday and every soccer game, and every time I turned around, there was a Costco cupcake. And so then it becomes hard to control, and it's so frustrating. You hate to be the parent that's always saying no. So it's, um, it's hard, but it does affect their behavior. And then you have these poor teachers that are pulling their hair out with kids that are misbehaving. They're all running around with like blue frosting on their face and eating cupcakes. So I'm like, well, we could change some of this behavior if we just didn't allow all this junk and uh, these chemicals to go into their body. 
Um, and, but also, the displacement of healthy food. If I'm going to drink or eat this, I'm not going to eat this, right? So it displaces healthy food, definitely contributes to mood disorders, particularly anxiety when you have sugar ups and downs and depression, um, hyperactivity, inability to concentrate. It can affect cognitive function. Uh, it can make people irritable, okay? Heart disease, uh, cancer, um, when you're inflamed and have blood sugar dysregulation, um, it can lead to those things. We know that diabetics are much at, uh, at, at a significantly a higher risk for heart disease. Um, it disrupts the minerals in your body. It causes something called advanced glycation end products, which um, cause your body to age faster when you eat a lot of sugar. It can contribute to learning disorders, um, yeast infections anywhere in the body. Um, it um, causes increased excretion of calcium, so it can lead to lower bone density. Okay, GI problems. Um, I've seen psoriasis in some of my patients clear up just without sugar. Like that's all we did was take sugar out, and your psoriasis got better. Doesn't work with everyone, but with some patients, that was the inflammatory trigger. Um, it can contribute to food allergies. Uh, headaches, other mood problems like depression, reduction of learning capacity, fatigue. Um, a lot of people tell you that when they first cut out sugar, they feel pretty bad for a few days, but then afterwards they have um, better brain power and more steady energy throughout the day. So, hormonal problems. Um, when middle aged women come to see me about their hormonal problems, or young women come to see me about their hormonal problems, uh, I correct the sugar thing first because the sugar is disrupting their endocrine system. So, you know, instead of just going and starting bioidentical hormones, let's fix the underlying cause of the problem. That's what functional medicine is. Um, inflammatory conditions, joint pain, asthma, dementia, uh, weight gain, of course diabetes, um, that more and more kids are becoming adult onset diabetes, which we don't even call it that anymore because so many kids are getting diabetes that they just let go of that name because sadly, we have children that are getting adult diseases now, and it disrupts sleep in some people. I know when my blood sugar is up and down, if I haven't regulated it well throughout the day and eaten every few hours, I have very sensitive blood sugar. I don't sleep well. So again, why do we care? Diabetes increases the following, cardiovascular disease, stress on many organs, premature aging complications, including blindness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, when we're talking diabetes and all that, um, all those consequences, um, that represents 11% of U.S. healthcare expenditure. So, you know, this is an expensive problem to have a bad diet for our society. Um, glycemic control, um, dysglycemia, so imbalanced blood sugar, elevated blood sugar, and ups and downs of blood sugar, uh, may be as important as hormonal stimulation in breast cancer induction. This is a holistic. Um, OBGYN that I've studied um, for that said that. So, um, you know, it's not just diabetes, it's not just heart disease, it's hormonal problems, it's breast cancer um, that, that is a, a consequence of eating too much sugar. Okay? Um, a Mayo, so cognition, brain function, a Mayo Clinic study of 1,200 people between the ages of 70 to 89 found that those who eat high food, high in carbs, have nearly four times the risk of developing mild cognitive impairment. The danger also rises with a heavy sugar diet. So um, type 3 diabetes is what people are starting to say, which is different forms of dementia that are caused by um, too much sugar that affects the structure of the brain. Mood. Our brain's biochemistry depends on what we eat or don't eat. Neurotransmitters are built upon nutrients, particularly amino acids and B-complex vitamins. Even our genes depend upon nutrients to work properly. When our blood sugar falls and we crash, ancient parts of our brain light up. We become aggressive, irritable, impatient, um, hangry is what we call it these days. Eating a sugary or starchy food solves the problem quick, quickly and temporarily, but starts a new up and down blood sugar cycle. Okay. The immune system, and I already talked about this where the white blood cell and something called phagocytosis starts to um, decrease when we eat sugar. The decrease in phagocytic index was rapid following the ingestion of simple carbohydrates. The greatest effects occurred between one and two hours postprandial, but the values were still significantly below the fasting control values five hours after feeding. So sugar represses the immune system. More people are now dying from the effects of obesity than from starvation. 
okay? And more people are dying of chronic degenerative illnesses that um, um, are caused by things like poor diet um, than infectious disease. You know, it used to be that we were worried about the plague, you know, or a flu epidemic. Uh, now we're just dying of bad choices, you know, that, and, and that are affecting um, how our health plays out and which, which genes are triggered. Consuming as little as one sugar sweetened soda daily has been associated with an increase in cardiovascular disease mortality, so it doesn't take a lot. Liquid sugar, interestingly, they don't know exactly why, but it's worse. And so that's the latte and the soda. An occasional treat becomes the default beverage, right? It used to be, um, my parents are about 80. They've been married like almost 60 years, 57, something like that. Anyway, um, so they talk about uh, when they were first married, it was such a big deal, once a week to go to the drugstore and split a Coke. Once a week, split it, right? What a treat. So who does that these days? Even people who don't have a lot of money can afford a six pack of Coke, unfortunately. And so the default beverage at a restaurant um, or when you're out and about is a soda. And if it's not a soda, it's, um, it's a fancy latte with liquid sugar. And so that's too bad because it's not healthy that we're consuming that much more and it's not just a special treat anymore. Um, the container size has increased, right? It used to be small, now it's a big gulp. And you can get free refills, so why not? Um, consumption of soda has tripled between 57 and 1998. Um, this does not include the sugar-laden, non-carbonated fruit drinks, energy drinks, sports drinks, and uh, chai lattes. <laughs> Um, sweetened carbonated beverages are made up solely of empty calories and are the primary source of added sugars in the diets of children. Studies show that from 1970 to 2000, the prevalence of obesity tripled, while intake of energy from fat decreased. It's sugar, it's not fat that's causing the problem. During this time, intake of sugar sweetened beverages increased dramatically. So it's not the fat that's making us fat. We all know that now. Healthy fats are okay, but it's the sugar and the carbs. Research links liquid sugar to weight gain and obesity. It causes heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, and cancer, and all the other things we've been talking about. New research suggests that regular consumption of liquid sugar can turn on genetics, which is going to incline our bodies to becoming fat. So liquid sugar is processed differently than solid sugar. Okay. Yale University endocrinologist Sonia, uh, Sonia Caprio wrote in an editorial that accompanied the study, the time has come to take action. She urged policymakers to focus first on measures that limit consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages, especially those served at low cost and in extensive portions to attempt to reverse the increase in childhood obesity. Liquid sugar consumption is associated with the development of hypertension, dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. Liquid sugar is associated with decreased satiety, and so one consumes more food. And I also think that when people sit down to have lunch or a snack, somehow they're not factoring in the liquid. You know, it's like, I'm eating this muffin, and I'm eating this all these calories and these other things, Somehow that's just like water. Like we're not—it's not quite registering that that's part of um, the food that we're eating. Gatorade um, has nine teaspoons, so like that sport drink to make you healthy. That's nice, nine teaspoons and 20 fluid ounces. Uh, 12 ounces of apple, grape, or orange juice contain the same amount of sugar as a 12-ounce can of soda. So maybe it's a little healthier because there's fiber and there's nutrients, like in a good cup of, you know, fresh squeezed orange juice. Uh, but it's still something that we should consume every day, several times a day. We should do that more in moderation. Fructose found in high fructose corn syrup is preferentially metabolized to lipids in the liver. Okay, so uh, we're, they're finding that liquid sugar and fructose are even worse than other forms of sugar. So that increases triglyceride le levels, that increases insulin, that leads to atherosclerosis, heart disease, so lots of research on this stuff. Fructose, uh, so that high fructose corn syrup, uh, increases uh, visceral fat. So when you, people start to have that apple shape or the Milwaukee goiter, as we say, with men that drink too much or people that drink too much, that's carbs. You know, this kind of pattern of weight gain is a carbohydrate pattern. So belly fat, or visceral fat as we call it, 
Um, and belly fat is more closely linked to disease than other kinds of fat. High fructose corn syrup is cheap to produce and it helps food brown better, so that's why it's used in the food industry and that's why it's ubiquitous and it's more harmful than just plain old white sugar that used to be used in the food industry. And fructose, like I said, raises triglycerides, cholesterol, LDL, you know, so people are getting these bad lipid panels back and they're being put on drugs, but perhaps if they had the motivation to change their diet and cut some of these things out or reduce them, they wouldn't need the drug, right? So get to the root cause of the problem instead of just repressing the problem, trying to resolve it with diet and lifestyle. But that does bring us to this whole aspartame issue of, well, okay, so if not sugar, how about artificial sweeteners like aspartame? Unfortunately, they have their own set of problems. And there's a, some consumer groups that are trying to get them either off the market or uh, put a warning on a can of soda that has aspartame in it, like, like a warning like on a pack of cigarettes or alcohol, right? Like get, a, get some labeling laws that say, look, this is a known neurotoxin. It's toxic, toxic to the nervous system. Some people are more vulnerable to its toxicities than others. But it is a neurotoxin, and kids are drinking it, and people think it's a health drink compared to uh, uh, soda that actually has high fructose corn syrup in it. So people are thinking it's healthier, and they're, um, they're, they're wrong. So we need to educate people about this. So aspartame is the technical name for the brand's name, NutraSweet, equal, spoonful, equal measure, all these things. Um, it's in almost all gums, and it's in a lot of you know sugar-free this, sugar-free that. Um, I know it's in almost all gums because I wouldn't let my son have it, and he was so frustrated, and I get so tired, like I said, of being the mom that says no to everything. So I'm like, okay, we're, we're going to find gum that just has sugar in it, and we're going to go to a regular place like Walgreens and not the co-op. Like, he just wants to be normal, you know? And so this is several years ago. We go to Walgreens, looked at every gum in the aisle, and I absolutely did not find any gum without aspartame. Let me know if you guys do. But it might even say, it, it might not even advertise that it's sugar-free, um, but you, if you look on the label of any gum that's a, that you buy at a regular grocery store or a drugstore, it has aspartame in it. Because I, I said, I'd rather just get you regular sugar gum than one with aspartame in it. I could not find one. Now, I can find it at the co-op, and I can find xylitol gum, but I was just trying to help him not take weird gum to school, you know, I mean, I just, I, I wanted him to be regular. I couldn't find it. So we walked out empty-handed with me mad and him crying, so. <laughs> ah, parenting. But anyway, um, so it accounts for 75% of the adverse reactions to food additives reported to the FDA. Okay, that's pretty significant. It's been associated with brain tumors, headaches, dizziness, anxiety, memory loss, joint pain, it contains methyl alcohol, which converts to formaldehyde. This causes damage to proteins and DNA. There's more information about it. There's a professor emeritus at Arizona State University in food and chemistry that wrote a book about it. But this is just, again, the food industry is pretty powerful. So, you know, kind of like the tobacco industry previously before they were forced to admit that there are problems with their product. Um, these things are dangerous, and there's research to prove it. But that doesn't mean there's, there's any uh, warning labels on a pack of gum that your child's um, chewing or that soda that, that your child is drinking or that you're drinking. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip for lack, for lack of time. These are kind of more technical slides. Um, well, I'm gonna, uh, let me talk about the, the other one. Uh, go forward. Oh, no, sorry. That one. That one. Um, yeah, this one. Lab assessment. Um, I... I uh, I pulled some of these slides out of a more technical talk that I was giving to colleagues. But I think that everybody should know, everybody every once in a while should um, have their fasting blood sugar and their fasting insulin measured by their primary care doc. Just ask for it. You should, if you have decent insurance, you should be able to get that paid for. Um, and you could have a lipid panel done. Um, and if you just had those things done, you could learn a lot about where you're at with your blood sugar and how you're doing with your diet. So, um, like if you just did a plain old lipid panel, and, and if you took your triglycerides and you divided it by your HDL, so your triglyceride to HDL ratio, um, 
should be uh, less than five. And let's see, serum insulin. Do you see where I say fasting? It shouldn't be greater than 15. I actually don't think it should be greater than five, the latest research says. Your fasting insulin shouldn't be greater than five. And you can ask your medical doctor to order that. Your fasting glucose, which you maybe have had done or you could easily have done, it's part of lots of routine workups, really shouldn't be greater than, than 90. And a lot of people's are. So, um, and then your triglycerides in a lipid panel really shouldn't be over 110. So your fasting insulin not over 5, your fasting glucose not over 90, your triglycerides not over 110. Um, so these are things that you can just get done. These are routine labs, nothing fancy, inexpensive labs. And you could then get some objective data and see how you're doing. And if it doesn't look good, make some changes and ask your medical doctor, so in like five months, if I change my diet and start exercising more, can we redo these? It's nice to have these objective markers to follow, to you know, um, just confirm that you're on the right track. And some people are so much more sensitive than others. You can see some people that eat a fair amount of sugar, their markers all look good. Other people that hardly eat any, their markers look bad. So that's the you know, connection of genetics with how you're eating. I mean, people, some people have, have um, the ability to metabolize sugar better. So, but those are just some basic labs that you could look at and get an idea of how you're doing from an, uh, an objective perspective. So Michael Pollan, um, so how do you choose food? You know, so we're talking about, oh, wow, wow sugar's like horrible, and I'm scaring you all, and, and I'm using this fear tactic. So let's talk about, so what do we do? Um, it is everywhere. It's, it is frustrating um, as, a, as a human being and as a mother. I, I think it's very frustrating. So, um, so we have to turn away a little bit from the frustration and go, well, then what do we do? Oh, yeah, well, what do we not do? Let's talk about what we don't do first. Okay, let's, uh, let's uh, we all try to stick to the four main food groups. Candy, candy canes, candy corns, and syrup. So I don't want Buddy the Elf to be your guru. Uh, but let's go back to Michael Pollan for just a second. But if you just eat food, not too much, mostly plants, like those seven little words are really helpful. So if you look at your plate and you're not overeating, and it, what do you mean eat food? Well, I don't mean eat chemicals and eat dyes and eat fake fat. I mean eat food. Eat broccoli, eat chicken, eat rice, stuff that came straight from the farm to your plate, not through a factory first, right? So, um, and mostly plants. Like if we just did that, that's a big improvement in our diet. So eat like that, let's follow Michael Pollan's seven little words, but not Buddy the Elf's. Okay, <laughs> so how much sugar is okay? We already saw this slide before. I'm just reminding you that we should eat about six teaspoons a day and that you can convert the grams on the Try and not eat packaged foods. There's a good start. But if you eat a packaged food, divide um, the grams of sugar by four, and that'll give you the teaspoons. Okay. Um, most children will choose sugar if given the choice. So that you know that's one area of great concern. Like we're all adults, we can make our choices, and we have to live with our choices. But a lot of in the room might be in charge of other people and children. Um, so we need to really educate them. We need to set an example. We need to be the unpopular bad guy every once in a while and walk out of Walgreens crying because we can't find gum without aspartame. So we need, to, we need to educate people and we need to be good examples. So what are some important concepts? Eat from the farm to the table. So I, just, I like general concepts. I don't really like um, having to you know, count, count things. and count, I don't like, personally, actually having to count the, the grams of sugar and all those things. So I really like the concepts. This food on my plate comes straight from the farm to my plate, or did it go through the factory? Did I shop the periphery of the grocery store and get all the fresh produce and the fresh meat and the fresh stuff, or did I get most of my stuff from the aisles that's all packaged and dyed and sugared up? Um, am I eat, pro, eating primarily the two Ps, produce and protein? You know, when I look at my plate, is it mostly produce and protein? A salad and some chicken or some beans and some eggs or whatever, or um, is, a, is a lots and lots of grain and, and, um, and carbohydrate. Um, and then I often teach my uh, patients, you know, half your plate should be veggies, a quarter of your plate should be carbohydrate, and a quarter of your plate should be <coughs> protein. So just kind of visualizing it, and um, I'll get to your question in a sec. Um, 
we need to kind of turn these ratios upside down. Most people are having big plates of pasta with a little bit of protein and veggies mixed in. Big plates of rice with a little bit of protein and veggies mixed in. We need a salad as a main dish with some good protein, and we need the side carbohydrate, not the side salad, the side carbohydrate. Tiny, a tiny little plate of rice, tiny little plate of uh, flour. So now I'm getting a little bit more into carbohydrates and away from sugar, but it turns into sugar in your body. So think in terms of maybe not counting things. Uh, maybe that's too fussy for some people, but your plate should be a lot of veggies, and you should have a side amount of grains and carbohydrates and not have that be the main dish. I've seen the, the plate ratio before. How big is the plate? Yeah, right? <laughs> Well, I guess I'm just thinking of a normal, you know, I mean, right. Change your mindset, yeah, no, it, it's, it's a concept, but sure. So I'm just thinking of a normal plate, not a salad plate, not a serving plate, <laughs> just a normal plate, you know. That, and so the main concept is mostly eat produce, you know, eat plants, not too much, you know, whatever that was that um, Michael Pollan said. Um, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Um, so, and that concept of the salad shouldn't be the side dish. The veggie shouldn't be the side dish. It should be the main dish. And then we have a, um, you know, a good quarter of a plate of protein and smaller amounts of carbohydrates. It's just kind of thinking along those lines and making those changes. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to never eat sugar again. We don't, you know, it's just let's head in the right direction and change um, at each meal a little bit how we're doing things. Um, and then, you know, I, I always tell people, you don't have to be perfect, especially when I'm talking to young girls, like teenagers. I had two teenagers in my office this morning. I don't want to create an eating disorder. We don't have to be perfect. But if we eat well 80% of the time, and then 20% of the time we're just eating junk, that's probably pretty good. I'd say most Americans eat poorly 80% of the time and health, and well 20% of the time. So we just need to transition to eating well most of the time and then not worrying about it part of the time. There's social and emotional reasons to eat, not just nutritional. We're not robots. We want to break bread with people and eat, you know, junky frozen pizza or something every once in a while and cake for dessert. That's okay if it's not the majority of the time. So we just have to kind of ch shift our focus a little bit and change the ratios of things. So how do we reduce sugar? Now, I do have some patients, and some people have that constitution where they're like, I'm just going to do it overnight. That's it. I'm done. Never eating it again. But that's the rare person. So mostly, and I don't know if I, this is in my handout or not, but it might be, um, mostly it's slowly. So if I, eat, if I drink a sugary latte five days a week at Starbucks, maybe I need to reduce that to two days a week. Um, and, you know, if I drink two sodas a day, maybe I just go to one and then a cup of black tea, you know. So usually if you think in terms of uh, reducing it slowly, it's more sustainable. The research on habit changes is really, if you do it slowly and thoughtfully, that it's more sustainable instead of being dramatic and drastic about it. Um, so slowly reducing your portions of sugar, reducing the amount of sugary drinks that you have, reducing your portions. You want to get a dessert, but split it, you know, those kinds of things. Um, I'm not really sure what I was thinking about the 25% rule, but I'm sure it made sense at the time when I wrote this talk. 50%, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, maybe that just meant, I think I was just thinking, you know, if you usually eat this much of something, you cut it down by a quarter. If you usually have this much of a soda, you cut it down by half. So just that idea of slowly stepping down on things um, to help you sustain these habit changes. Um, and then also substitute. I mean, certainly there are times when you're like, oh, I just, I want a brownie. Um, well, you know, these raw rev bars at the co-op, especially the chocolate peanut butter ones, they're awesome. And that satisfies me as much as a brownie, and it has just a couple grams of sugar. It's mostly like a nut butter with a tiny few chocolate chips mixed in to make you think you're eating something sweet. And somehow it works, and it tastes good. So, um, so, you know, making sure you have plenty of healthy substitutes. If you're ravenous and your blood sugar is dropping and you've got some almonds that have a few ha a handful of uh, raisins in your purse, then you're going to be able to eat that and feel sat satiated and not have that cookie, right? So you have to do a little planning. You have to have stuff in your, in your desk or in your purse to substitute things in when you're feeling like you want something unhealthy. Um, educate yourself, that's why you're here. The more education you have, the more you understand why it's important, the more you tend to make better choices. Um, 
and clean out the kitchen. I'll tell you, you know, if it's 10 o'clock at night and my son's in bed and I'm kind of getting a craving or something and that it's in the house, I'm likely to eat it. So we just actually don't keep sugar in our house. If we're going to eat sugar for a treat as a family, <clears throat> we have to run over to Hubbard Diner in Middleton and actually get the pie and bring it home. <laughs> we don't have it in our house. And so when I'm hungry at night and feeling like, hmm, I kind of want something, then I'm more likely to have a handful of almonds or a piece of Ezekiel bread with organic butter on it or you know something like that to satisfy my hunger instead of something sugary. So clean out your kitchen. Um, fill up with good stuff. Make sure you satisfy your hunger with healthy, good quality food. Not necessarily quantity, but quality. Like I said, go out for treats. Make it an event. You know, go out for a cup of coffee and a pastry instead of the ones that are in your house. Um, if you have kids, especially when my son was younger, and you know, he, he, uh, they always go to the pantry and they're standing there. Make sure you have a healthy snack shelf for your kids, if you have kids, or for yourself. Um, you know, in the refrigerator or in the pantry that, you know, hey, this stuff is always available. If you want an apple, if you want some almonds, if you want a raw rev bar, um, this is the stuff that you can always help yourself to. Uh, we talked about eating straight from the farm to your plate. Um, learn how to read labels and look at the amount of sugar like we were talking about. Um, drink water, herbal tea with a few drops of stevia. Make sure you have plenty of healthy beverages around if you like something other than water so that you're like, oh, I really want that soda, but how about this cup of tea, this Earl, Earl, Earl Grey tree with some stevia in it, maybe it can satisfy my, my hankering for a soda. Um, I gave this talk to a, a, a group of teachers and parents, so I've got a lot of kids stuff in here. Dessert rules, you're the parent. I think I just get tired of parents that can't say no. You know, when you're just like, sure, you can have everything. Sometimes we just have to be unpopular and just say, these are our family values. We don't eat a lot of sugar. Over time, I've seen with my 14-year-old, he really gets it. And when he goes to someone's house, and, someone's house and eats a lot of sugar, he comes home feeling poorly, which is great. Next time, he's not going to do that again. He's going to make a better choice. So when you raise someone to have a certain kind of a palate, um, they tend to make better choices. And we do have to just say no sometimes. And so I think that was the message I was trying to get the group of educators and parents I was talking to. So some ideas, and I think on the handout that I gave you, some of these things are on there. Um, some people like frozen fruit. I mean, my son loves a big bowl of frozen fruit for a treat. Homemade popsicles, I always make those for my son. Uh, always having trail mix on hand. Um, yogurt fruit smoothie, smoothies with stevia. Uh, uh, preferably non-GMO popcorn. Um, fruit with like a fun yogurt dip with stevia and some fruit mixed in the yogurt and you can make a fun dip that way or a tasty dip. Veggies with a dip, cheese sticks, let's see if I have more ideas, I guess I don't, but I think there's more ideas on here um, just to help, you know, help you guys start with um, replacing some things in your kitchen. So there's a lot of good books out there. So these aren't the only ones, but I think it's good, to, especially if we tend towards being addicted to sugar and we eat, and we eat a lot for comfort. If that's our relationship with food, it's good to pick up a few books. Um, Nourishing Wisdom by Mark David's a good one that talks about redefining your relationship with food because there are a lot of people that eat for emotional reasons all the time, and of course that leads to problems. So there are some good books out there that uh, look at the, the psychology behind that um, and help you redefine your relationship with food. Um, another book by Mark David, The Slow Down Diet, um, you know, the slow food movement, spending more time um, thinking about your food, planning your food, instead of just uh, 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 a lot of people don't take the time to plan their meals. And when you don't take the time to plan your meals and to grocery shop, then what are you going to do? You're going to eat fast food and you're going to eat more restaurant food and you're going to eat stuff that's convenient and less healthy. So, again, um, making it a priority and uh, taking the time to learn about cooking. And I'm teaching my son to cook because I don't want him to be that young adult that goes out and is only making frozen pizzas. Um, so we have to really, it, it has to be a priority. We have to you know, stir that pot a little bit, spin that plate, and, and make sure that we spend the time educating ourselves and our children. And you know, if you want to try cutting out sugar, did you guys see, anyone see the movie Fed Up that was put out by 
actually the Institute for Functional Medicine where I went to school. And I think Katie Kirk was part of that, right? Um, maybe Mark Hyman, who's another functional medicine doctor. Um, he's actually Hillary and Bill Clinton's doctor. But he's a functional medicine doctor. So the Fed Up, uh, Fed Up was a movie that talked about sugar and its effects in the sugar industry. And so you can go online and Google Fed Up Movie, Fed Up Challenge, and you can sign up for their emails, and they help you cut sugar out of your diet for 10 days, which, you know, like three weeks, three months, that's kind of daunting, but you can kind of do anything for 10 days. So it's fun to do with some friends or your family. You do the Fed Up Challenge, they send you emails, they educate you about sugar, and you commit to cutting sugar out for 10 days. It's kind of a nice amount of time to see how that feels to um, do that. So that's a resource for you to help you cut out sugar. So does that include, like, I always think about, you know, my son doesn't drink juice, but he drinks a lot of milk, and then he eats kefir. And there's like 11 grams of sugar or something in that serving of unsweetened. There's milk. 11 grams of sugar in unsweetened kefir? I think something like in a cup, in a cup of it. I mean, yeah, it's a lot of That you make or that you buy? That I buy. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look at different brands of kefir and see, but that is a lot of... So I feel like, yeah, and I just work, so I guess I'm, my question is really around dairy and the sugar that's like in well, milk or Well, okay, so that kind of opens up a whole other yeah. can of worms, but um, so the good thing about kefir is that it also has protein and fat, okay? Yeah. So when you couple your sugar with protein and fat, it slows down the absorption and doesn't affect your blood sugar as much. Okay, so I mean, if you were drinking 10 cups of kefir a day, but so again, you gotta look like moderation and diversity in our food and maybe scale back the serving a little bit because even eating too much natural sugar is not good. But that is certainly a much better choice than most. I would just make sure the portions are correct and, um, and know that when you're, it's coupled with fat and with protein that you are slowing down the absorption and doesn't have as many ill effects. Nicole, are you able to stay a little bit? Yeah, because I see that it is a little after 12.30. We'll take one more question, and then I'll stay and answer any other questions after that. So I know you didn't want to name drop brands before, but I also see you have healthy nutrition bars on here. And much like your son, I have a teenage son, and yeah. they're just machines. They need to be uh, eating all the so time, right? It's so expensive, yeah. And so is there, like... You know, I do you like raw them? Rev bars. Okay. I mean, that you can get them at the co-op, and I sell them at my practice simply because I want to get them at cost for my son. <laughs> yeah. But for those no. maybe but don't live in Madison and have quick access to co-ops and right. whatnot, is well, there other more common ones oh. that we can find without making special trips into Madison? Ooh. Oh, I see. Well, raw rev bars you can probably buy on the internet, but um, um, I have to admit that every time I go to look at nutrition bars, I'm surprised at how much sugar they have. So the raw rev bars I was really pleased with, the amount of protein and the lack of sugar and the taste. Because someone would be like, look, this has no sugar. And I'm like, but it tastes like cardboard. Right. So that doesn't help. So I've loved the raw rev bars because they taste awesome. They don't have a lot of sugar. They have a lot of protein. Um, but I have found that most other mainstream bars don't, uh, don't fit that, that bill. So off the top of my head, I can't tell you other than that brand. Mm -hmm. I am sure that they're out there. So if anyone has any ideas. Think Thin. I would have to look at, you know, again, I'd have to look at the label of a Think Thin bar. Um, but it's got sugar alcohol, and I was going to ask you if that's Okay, so well. sugar alcohol um, isn't that bad. That's like xylitol is a sugar alcohol, but in some people it'll cause diarrhea. So if you have too much sugar alcohol, you can get loose stools. So, um, you know, so when you look at a nutrition bar... Um, you want to, you, you hope that it has like at least less than 10 grams of sugar, less than five would be great, like the raw rev bars. You hope that it has at least 10, nine to 10 grams of protein. Um, so those g give you some guidelines. Um, but uh, it is not easy to find a healthy nutrition bar that tastes good. So that's where Tramix comes in, because just having um, a bunch of almonds with a few little raisins mixed in, um, you know, can be really tasty and healthy and more economical than expensive nutrition bars. <coughs> Sorry, I don't have a good list for you there. Well, it's, but, you know, 
I'm sure at 14 you can appreciate they're done with school, they've got soccer mm -hmm. or some other mm -hmm. practice where they're going to spend a lot of energy. Yeah, fruit and nuts, fruit and nuts, fruit and nuts. You know, like if you can get them to eat that, which I know isn't always right exactly what they want, but um, yeah. So, so 12 grams of protein, one gram of sugar. And I think 10? Yeah. So what is it? 12 grams of protein, one gram of sugar. 20 grams of protein. Oh, 20, so that's pretty big. How many grams of sugar? 13 grams of protein. And oh, five, five grams. grams, that's pretty good. So a think thin bar is pretty good. Just Now I'm just glancing at the, sure. at the grams of stuff. Oh, she has it up here. But from just like 13 grams of protein, 20 grams of protein, and then you see <coughs> the sugars where I can't read it, like five grams, that's pretty good. Okay. Yeah, there's that's, if it tastes good, does anyone know if it tastes good? Yeah, I don't know. Does it? Good. Yeah. Okay. So I'll stick around for a few minutes if anyone has any other questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.